Middle school was a period of time where I was really getting into all of my hobbies and interests I would have today. Whenever I wasn't being diligent in my schoolwork, I was either watching a bunch of different anime, either on my laptop or through the anime network or Toonami, drawing, listening and discovering new music, and of course, gaming. But what made this period of time so memorable was the things I was discovering around that time. And around the 6th or 7th grade, one of the two, I discovered a franchise that to this day I go back to constantly. And it's all thanks to a fan animation known as Phoenix Wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, non-binary peeps, we're talking about Ace Attorney. Ace Attorney is a franchise that got to start back in 2001, and since then we had over 11 games released with 6 mainline games, 4 spin-offs, and a crossover with the Professor Layton series. And with the release of the Apollo Justice trilogy earlier this year, as well as the upcoming Investigations collection which was announced while struggling with this damn script, I wanted to take the opportunity to gush about one of my favorite franchises. And thus, for this retrospective, we're mainly going to be covering the mainline games. Everything from the first Ace Attorney game all the way up until Spirit of Justice. Now, I had thought about adding in the spinoffs, especially for the investigation games, considering that it's coming out in September. But I felt as if those games kind of deserve their own time in the spotlight. Plus, I'm not trying to go too overboard like I did with the Mega 10 retrospective. Now, I will admit, I took on way too much to the point of getting burnt out. And with this retrospective in particular, I'm already trying to debate how I want to do this because of how long these games can get and because I was struggling to write this script, which literally took a month to do. Even if you don't believe in the guide please pray for me because my brain is dying over here but before we get things started i feel like we need a little bit of a history lesson here especially considering the company involved Capcom. If we're talking about companies other than Nintendo that revolutionized gaming, then Capcom is definitely one of them. Not only were they responsible for making Street Fighter 2, which revolutionized the way we play fighting games, they were also responsible for Resident Evil, which besides revolutionizing the survival horror genre in the gameplay sense, it also revived the zombie genre, which around that time was practically dead. Don't believe me? Look it up for yourself. You'll be surprised. Fast forward to 1999 and Capcom releases Dino Crisis, and amongst the team who worked on the game, there was one person who would eventually get the chance to make his very own game, that being Shu Takami. Takami got his start in Capcom in 1994, and during that time he was mainly a planner. For those who have zero clue on what this world does, um... Think about it like a game designer just without the knowledge of knowing how to code or how to work a game engine, if that makes sense. The first game Takami would work on was, and I apologize in advance if I get the pronunciation wrong on this, Gako no Kouai Iwasa Hanako-san Gakita, a licensed title for the anime of the same name. He would later be picked up by Shinji Mikami to work on Dino Crisis as both the event director and one of the main planners. After the release of Dino Crisis 2, which he was a director for, Takami would get the opportunity from Mikami to make any game he wanted, albeit with some caveats. The biggest being that he would only have about 6 months to develop the game, though in actuality it would be about 10 months overall. During the early stages of the game's development, it was originally planned to be developed on the Game Boy Color, with the goal of making the gameplay so simple that anyone could play it. And one of the biggest inspirations for this game was Takumi's love of mystery novels. We talking Lupin, Sherlock Holmes, and many other mystery stories you could think of. It would even become the original basis for the game's protagonist, who was originally going to be a private investigator. He even would have had a little pet hamster with him, which honestly, I feel like it should have stayed within the final game. But as the early stages were progressing, things ended up changing. The most notable change was the game's intended platform, as it went from being developed on the Game Boy Color to being developed on the Game Boy Advance after seeing a prototype of Mega Man Battle Network. The other change was with the role for the main pro tag, as it changed from being a private investigator to being a defense attorney, which Takumi felt was a great fit. It was also because the original version of the game was criticized so heavily that they had to rework everything. And mind you, that's only one out of the many issues with the development of this game. But after 10 months of development and going through some rough patches here and there, Japanese audiences would be introduced to Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, or Gakuten Saibin. Game Boy Advance. No! 
Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney was originally released on October 12, 2001, and the game has you playing as the titular rookie defense attorney who sets out to prove that his clients are innocent, all the while being faced with an old friend and a dysfunctional justice system. When the game was released, it was met with positive reviews with many praising the unique premise and loving the hell out of the art, music, and characters in the story. However, some found the game to be too linear, with the gameplay either feeling tedious, boring, or hell, even both. Eventually, the game would come to the States for the DS on October 15th, 2005. And before I started researching for this video, I expected this game to be a modest success. Come to find out that that was a fucking lie. Everybody and their mother was buying this game, and because the demand for it was exceeding Capcom's expectations, they of course had to make more copies, and by that point, it sold over 100,000 copies, which I didn't even know about until researching for this video. Hell, the research in general for this game was absolutely insane. There's a lot that I found during my research, but the one that ticks the cake was that one of the working titles for this game was going to be, and I kid you not, Boogie Woogie Innocence. Like, what kind of name is that? Like, it sounds like a rhythm game where you're dancing to not get proven guilty or something. I mean, like, I guess it makes sense, but I don't know. It's still pretty weird. Regardless, the success of this game and the franchise as a whole would help popularize visual novels here in the West, and it will also become the inspiration for games like Detective Pikachu, Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law, and even that game. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Though after 2017, the franchise would lay dormant for a bit. That was until 2019 when Capcom released the Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney trilogy to modern platforms. While this trilogy was created exclusively for mobile phones, it was the first time where people could play it on their console. Kinda. Two years later, we would get the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, which brought those two games over to the West for the first time ever. And fast forward to today, and we now have the Apollo Justice Trilogy, and later the Investigations Collection coming in September, making almost all the Ace Attorney games accessible to new and old players alike. Now, all we need is a port of the Professor Layton crossover, and we'll be golden. Like with the Megaton retrospect, we're going to be looking at the evolution of this franchise, starting from the humble beginnings to the absolute insanity that is the most recent mainline title. Though before we actually begin, we're, we're gonna be doing something a little different for these videos. Unlike most of my videos where I usually segment things off to story and gameplay, we're instead gonna be combining them all into one. You see, the gameplay and story in Ace Attorney is heavily connected. You can't really talk about one without talking about the other, or at least that's how I kind of imagine it. So it makes a lot of sense, at least to me, to talk about the two together. Then there's another change we're gonna be doing. Obviously, this game is a visual novel, so there's more story than there is gameplay. And because of how dense the story and details are in Ace Attorney, I'm not gonna be dumping the story on y'all like I usually do. Instead, I'm gonna be doing a sort of quick summary of what happens, all the while trying my best to include the most important details. Of course, I'm bound to forget something, so if I do, please let me know in the comments below. Just don't be a dick about it, because I am sensitive and I will cry. And I don't think you want that on your conscience. If you want to go into this game blind, I suggest either liking this video or saving it to watch later and going to play the games yourself. And if you decide to continue on, I will have timestamps for each of the cases in the description below. So, with that out the way, let's get started with the first turnabout. The game begins with the aftermath of a murder. At first, the killer ends up panicking until he realizes that he knows exactly who to pin the blame on. Fast forward to the day of the trial and we meet Phoenix Wright, a rookie defense attorney who is about to undergo his first ever trial. With him is his boss and mentor Mia Fey who joins him for moral support. As we're prepping for the trial, we get a brief rundown of this case where our defendant is Phoenix's childhood friend, Larry Butts, who's being accused of killing his girlfriend. And let's just say he's definitely an odd one. This case serves as the first half of the tutorial for this game, with it establishing the flow of trials and what to expect going into things. We won't see some of the other mechanics this game has until the next case, but what's shown here is enough to get an idea of how things work. This also applies to earlier when we saw who the killer was, and it might seem weird at first, and trust me, it was when I first played it, but it does alleviate a lot of the work of figuring out who the killer may be, so all you gotta do is learn the gameplay and figure out the motive. What's more is that the moment the trial begins, they don't waste any time introducing one of the most important things to do in this game. 
Before the trial fully begins, the judge quizzes us about the case, and the only way to pass it is by going through your court records. This acts as your inventory where you can look through your evidence and see the profiles of different people introduced in the case. While the latter isn't that important, the evidence you obtain is, and the game makes sure of this by reminding you throughout the game to check it, if not directly, then subtly, and it's something to keep in mind as you're going through trials, especially for what's about to come up real soon. After getting further details about the case from the prosecution surrounding the murder weapon and time of death, they call in the main witness Frank Sawhead, a newspaper salesman to give his testimony of the murder, and after his testimony is when we have to go through cross-examinations. After the witness shares their testimony about topics like what they saw, what they did, and the works, you have to go through it and expose any possible contradictions in their testimony. You do this by presenting evidence at the statement that seems to be the most contradictory. And prepare yourself to hear that word a lot, because it's going to get tossed around as many times as someone mentioning hearts or darkness in Kingdom Hearts. Once you're able to point out the contradiction, the rest is pretty much just exposition on why the evidence contradicts the witness's testimony. Sometimes you'll have to answer a question and or explain your reasoning by presenting other pieces of evidence after doing so. But be mindful of the evidence you do present, because if you present the wrong one or at the wrong statement, you'll end up getting a penalty. And if you keep messing up, then it's game over and your client gets the guilty verdict. Don't fret though, because you are able to save at any time, so if you mess up, you can't just reload your save until you get it right. Um, disclaimer though, this only works for the trilogy version and not the DS or GBA versions, unfortunately. This is all we get to see for now, but the game does a great job at teaching you this without feeling like it's holding your hand. Plus, a lot of the testimonies aren't easy enough to expose the contradictions for. Besides maybe one moment, there really isn't anything in this case that'll trip you up. As for how the case goes, Phoenix is able to figure out that Frank saw Hip was the killer after exposing the actual time he entered into the apartment. Despite getting tripped up on the possibility of the clock being slow, with the help of Mia, Phoenix manages to figure out that the clock was set three hours behind. And during all of this, we get to see just how distraught the witness gets, and it even gets to the point where they even have a freaking breakdown in the middle of the courtroom. I bet you that things became extremely awkward seeing the witness damn near having a mental breakdown and frothing at the mouth. Nevertheless, Phoenix is able to secure a not guilty verdict for Larry, though he doesn't seem exactly happy about being free. Uh, uh, never mind, this dude is fucking weird. But just as Phoenix and Mia would go on to celebrate, a tragedy would occur that would change everything. The case begins when Mia calls her younger sister Maya to hold some evidence for her, specifically the Dinker, the murder weapon from the last case, as it has something important hidden inside of it. Fast forward to later that night, and we hear a conversation of Mia telling a mysterious man that she doesn't have the papers that he's looking for. And after telling Mia that he knows she has them inside the Dinker, he uses it to kill her. And the last thing we see is a man with a rather lavish appearance. Moments after, Phoenix shows up to meet with Mia, only to find her dead body and a girl crying right next to her. While trying to investigate what happened and talking to the girl who we find out is Mia's younger sister, Maya, a woman from the building next to us ends up calling the police, with them rushing over and arresting the two. After being questioned by the police, Phoenix heads to the detention center to meet with Maya, where she asks him to get a lawyer by the name of Marvin Grossberg to be her defense attorney. Unfortunately, when Phoenix meets with Grossberg, he sharply declines, and with no one else to defend her, Phoenix decides to defend Maya in court. Similar to the last case, this serves as the second half of the tutorial for this game. Not only does it focus on the other things you can do during trials, it also focuses on the other half of this game, the investigations. These sections of the game has you moving from area to area, gathering evidence, and talking to witnesses. Think about it like finding pieces of the puzzle so that when you go to trial, you can put them together to reveal the truth. For the most part, there's only four options that's available to you when going through investigations. The first option is examine, where you pretty much explore your surroundings. You have a cursor you move around, and when it lights up, you can interact with whatever's there. Doing this will normally give you a piece of evidence, but sometimes it'll just be used for some of the game's more comedic moments. The next and most obvious option is move, which lets you move from area to area. Nothing really special there. The third option, which is equally as obvious, is talk, where you're able to talk to someone in the current area you're in. Talking to someone will give you about three different topics to talk about, with some opening up new topics. However, sometimes the talk will stall for a variety of reasons, and in order to get things moving again, you gotta do the next option. Present, which is the final option you can do and allows you to show evidence to the person in the area you're in. Most times, presenting evidence to someone can lead to them saying something along the lines of, What am I supposed to do with that? But presenting the right evidence can lead to an entirely new dialogue option or it'll give you new slash updated evidence. 
All of this is the bread and butter when it comes to investigations, and while we don't experience it yet, the investigation portions are easily the most annoying thing about this game and the others in the series. At worst, you will be spending a lot of time roaming around and examining every nook and cranny for a semblance of progression. And these portions alone is enough for me to recommend looking up a spoiler free guide. Cause there's nothing more annoying than moving from area to area not knowing what the fuck to do or where to go. Granted, it's not like how it was with the GBA and DS versions, where you would have been pixel hunting like a motherfucker. Now, while we're on the subject of gameplay, earlier I mentioned how this case also shows another thing you can do during trials, and that involves press. Unlike in the first case, where you just have to present evidence to a statement that's contradictory, things in this case aren't exactly easy, as at first glance, the witness's testimony seems like it doesn't have any contradictions, and the only way to get that out is by pressing their testimony. You do this by going to a statement and pressing the L button, where afterwards, Phoenix will ask for the witness to elaborate on what they've said. Press it can be used to not only bring out the contradiction, but it can also be used to gather information, which is especially helpful when you're having a hard time with a witness's testimony or trying to figure out what the contradiction is in their statement. And usually when you do press a statement, you'll either get an elaboration of what they've said, or you'll get some funny banter between you and the witness. Though if you're lucky enough, Pressing the statement can later lead to you having the option to press further, and doing this will have the witness revise their statement, with 9 times out of 10 that being the opportunity to expose the contradiction. Just like with looking at your evidence, pressing is something you do need to get a handle on because later cases will have testimonies that almost feel impossible to crack. And again, just like in the last case, the game shows this to you and shows different situations where you may have to use it. Afterwards though, that's pretty much it, and by this point, the game has shown you most of the stuff relating to what goes on during these trials and investigations. But something I have yet to mention about this case is one of the other purposes that it shows off. Beyond the introduction of other gameplay elements, Turnabout Scissors has sort of a third purpose, and it's to introduce both the reoccurring characters in this game and the franchise staple, the eccentric as characters. Turnabout Sisters introduces three other characters we'll be seeing throughout this game. The first is Maya Faye, the younger sister of Mia. The second is Dick Gumshoe, a detective who's competent but does have moments where you question how the hell he became a detective in the first place, and finally, the main prosecutor for this game, Miles Edgeworth, who is described as the demon prosecutor who has never lost a case. However, this case doesn't exactly go deep into their character, and just shows how they are at face value. Maya is compassionate, Gumshoe is a dork, and Edgeworth is cold-hearted. It isn't until the later cases where we learn more about their personality and motivations, though I wish we could have spent more time with these three and maybe get more of an idea of their character in this case alone, but it does make sense that it's simple for now, with the later cases showing off more of their character, but they aren't the only characters to talk about as we do have the more weird and eccentric ones to talk about. You see, its attorney, beyond his story and gameplay, is known for his wacky and downright weird ass characters. At first glance, they seem like any ordinary person, but as the case continues and you eventually cross examine them in court, they quickly become the opposite of that. You kind of saw this with Larry in the first Turnabout, who was pretty loud and erratic, but Turnabout's sister spends his time introducing other characters that are just as weird. One that may or may not cross your mind is Maya Faye. She isn't necessarily weird like some of the others we're about to mention, but what makes her eccentric is the fact that she comes from a family that's known for their ability to communicate with spirits. While we don't see it until later in the case, that alone shows off that the world of Ace Attorney is not exactly normal. There's others like April May, a seemingly cute and lively woman who at first seems to just be all cute and shit. But during the first day of the trial, this persona quickly vanishes, and we see April's true colors as someone so aggressive that one wrong move or one statement will have her rip your heart out your ass. Later, we meet the bellboy of the Gatewater Hotel, who honestly might be the weirdest bellboy I've ever seen in my life. During the second day of the investigation, if you ask this man about April May, he'll say she do it. Excuse me, but she do what exactly? Now, I might be wrong in assuming this, and if I am, so be it. But after Phoenix says he might be the most suspicious person here, I can only imagine that the bellboy thought he was gonna get some you know what. You's a freaky ass nigga! But there's one more eccentric character, and that's the killer of this case, Red White. You know what, now I'm thinking about what kind of fucking name is this? Red White is the CEO of Blue Corp and the one responsible for killing Mia. Unlike in the first Turnabout, where we already knew who the killer was and spent the duration of the trial finding the motive, Turnabout's sisters has it to where both the investigation and the trial is spent finding the identity of the killer and figuring out the motive. Though the letter quickly becomes clear when we learn that White's whole business 
is built around gathering info to where white can blackmail whoever is in need of his services. And doing this lets him have control over any powerful figure to the point where he's damn near unstoppable. He even whoops our ass just to prove his point further, like, <laughs> That's right! I'm back to New York car, Nyaka! What you gonna do? What you gonna do? Compared to the last killer, Red White is the first case of the game showing us the epitome of a bastard. The more you learn about White and his crimes, the more you come to despise this dude, never mind the fact that he has the police by the balls. And it gets even worse when you learn that White was somewhat connected to a case that happened 15 years prior to the events of the game known as DL6. This bizarre murder case not only became the reason why Mia and Maya's mother Misty Faye would disappear from their lives, it also became the catalyst for Mia to become a defense attorney and investigate White, who she believed was responsible. And spoiler alert, he was, and it's thanks to Grossberg who gave him some info surrounding the case for money, and which also became the reason why Grossberg didn't defend Maya. Now, make sure to keep DL6 in the back of your mind, because there's more to that story as we continue on with this game. Overall, White is a big step up compared to the killer from the last case. He's someone you come to quickly hate, and he draws out one more bit of bullshit when after getting exposed for his crimes, he uses his resources to get Phoenix arrested and makes him the prime suspect. And before the day even ends, we get a piece of world building for this game's world that further makes this situation kind of fucked up. Because of the influx of cases presented to the courts, the legal system was changed to have a three day limit for trials, with a good majority of them ending both in a single day and with a guilty verdict. This is among the interesting things we learned about the world of this game, and something I found even more interesting is that the way the legal system works in the Ace Attorney games is somewhat similar to how the system works in Japan. For those who don't know, Japan has a 99% conviction rate, which for a long story told short, is done by exposing loopholes in the system as well as doing a bunch of fucked up shit. And while the game doesn't outright show that, it does feel implied in a lot of ways, mainly with the judge showing up bit of favoritism for the prosecution. It might not have been the intention for the developers to talk about this, but it's still interesting to think about nonetheless. Now, I gave a pretty short description of all of that, and there's a lot more when it comes to Japan's judicial system. So if you're curious about what I just mentioned, I included a link in the description to a report that goes into detail about it. But beyond that, how does this case end? On the final day of the trial, Phoenix is joined by Maya for moral support, and as the trial goes on, Phoenix is able to slowly disprove White's testimony and is close to proving that he's the murderer. But just as they begin to corner him, Esworth is able to get White to admit that he was the one that placed the wiretap, but he couldn't have killed Mia because of what, you may ask? A fucking light stand. More specifically, when that light stand was bought. Are you fucking- Unable to counter that, Phoenix ends up almost accepting defeat when suddenly Mia appears and Phoenix blacks out. So, remember when I said Maya was a spirit medium in training? Well, when Phoenix wakes up, we learn that Maya was able to channel Mia's spirit after seeing Phoenix struggling in court. With her help, we learn that the light stand was bought the day before the murder, which goes against White's confession, but it doesn't do much as Edward quickly calls for another day. But then, Mia gives Phoenix a note that contains everyone that White has blackmailed, and as Phoenix is about to read out the list, White ends up freaking out and confesses to having killed Mia. With that, Phoenix is declared innocent, resulting in Edward's first ever defeat. Later on that night, Phoenix meets up with Maya and the two begin to work together under the newly formed Wright & Co. Law Offices. This case in the first turnabout has to be some of the best examples of how not only to do a tutorial, but also how to hook people into your game. There's so much that it does right, such as not really holding your hand when going through stuff and introducing a cast of characters that stands out. And even though I didn't talk about them as much here, their introduction is good enough to get a general idea of what they're like. But the character we see the most out of in these two cases is Phoenix. Phoenix. He's someone who's altruistic and is willing to do anything to prove his clients are innocent, even when it puts them in the worst situations like earlier when he tried to expose Red White. But this loyalty to his client shows off not only his reasoning for becoming an attorney, but his influences as well. As an attorney, Phoenix wants to help those who seem like they've been abandoned, and while this is still early in the story, you can tell that Mia was one of his biggest influences, so this instills in him a lot of what it means to be an attorney, from always believing in his clients, even when things uh, look rough, and to always look at things in different ways. And trust me, this is something that would eventually help Phoenix in the next three cases we're going to be talking about. Also, side tangent here, but no matter how many times I play this game, I always hate the fact of how quickly they killed Mia. Besides a future character we'll talk about soon, Mia is one of my favorite characters in this franchise, especially for how good of a mentor she is to Phoenix. She's also fine as hell, so I mean, 
that could be another reason why I like her so much. But her death does make up for the fact that she is still around through Maya. Her channeling Mia's spirit is going to be a common occurrence throughout the next two games, not only for assistance when things get a little rough, but for some story relevancy that plays a part in something even bigger. But we won't know about that or Mia until both Justice for All and Trials and Tribulations. And god damn it, I ain't fucking ah I hate this because I wanna fucking go ahead right now, but I if I do, I'm gonna spoil something. Just, just ah now before we talk about the next three cases, there is something that you guys need to know. From this point on, the cases begin to get a little longer with you having to do more for both the investigations and trials. While the next case isn't that bad, the next two after it are, and it gets crazy. Anywho, let's head on to the next case where the training wheels really come off. It's been a month since Maya and Phoenix's trial, and despite it being the talk of the town, they have yet to get any new clients. And during this, we get a quick scene of Maya going crazy over a show called The Steel Samurai, Warrior of Neo Old Tokyo. But this changes when Phoenix wakes up early the next day to a call from Maya telling us that the lead actor of Steel Samurai was arrested for murder. While the two are watching the news back in the office, they get a call from the actor himself asking for them to defend him in court. Phoenix and Maya head to the detention center where they meet with Will Powers, the actor who plays the role of the Steel Samurai, and after some shenanigans and hearing Will's side of the story, Phoenix decides to defend him in court and they waste no time heading to the crime scene. Unlike the first two cases, Turnabout Samurai is different in so many ways. The one that's the most obvious is that the killer isn't shown immediately, and we now have to find their identity, motive, and how they did it. The other change is the fact that this case is a little longer than Turnabout Sisters, whereas that case took around two days, Turnabout Samurai takes a whole three, which means not only do we get to see the three day trial in action, we also get to see more out of the characters we met in the last case, and get introduced to a whole new cast of eccentric characters. The first is Maya Fey, who at this point in the story is practically our assistant, and the best way to describe her is that she's almost a polar opposite to Phoenix, where he's chill and pretty laid back, Maya is very outgoing and impulsive in a lot of ways. Her curiosity often gets the best of her, and most times it just leads to some comedic moments that brings out Phoenix's more sarcastic side. But when she isn't doing all of that, she's constantly helping Phoenix and acting almost as a second brain. She even uses her powers to channel Mia when Phoenix is in a bind during the investigation or trial. And to fast forward a bit, this desire to help would end up being a double-edged sword for her as she later struggles to use her powers, which makes her feel worthless to Phoenix. Beyond that though, she is the epitome of a partner in crime. Speaking of crime, the other reoccurring character we see in this game is Detective Gumshoe. Now, at first, I was a little hesitant to talk about Gumshoe here as it felt like there wasn't much we know about him compared to Maya. And while he shines a lot in the next case, Turnabout Samurai, in retrospect, does have enough where I could talk about him for a quick bit. Gumshoe is the main detective in these games, and even though he could be a doofus at points, he is a competent detective that is extremely loyal towards Esworth. While this loyalty is mainly seen in the next case, throughout this one, he often prevents us from looking into certain things, though most of the times it ends with him failing. Regardless, he still ends up helping us from time to time, and he doesn't really use his loyalty to Esworth as a way to be rude to us. Other than that, there isn't really much we learn about him beyond the fact that he's a lovable doofus, making him a fan favorite in the franchise. As for Edgeworth, I'm gonna leave that to the next case where it's basically all about him. Now, compared to the last case, which felt sadder and a little somber, Turnabout Samurai is a lot more comedic thanks to the very weird cast of characters that we're introduced to. During the first day of the investigation, Phoenix and Maya comes across Wendy Oldbag, the security guard at Global Studios. Now, I want you to imagine her as one out of the hundreds of old people who be saying how kids these days don't want to work and they be on their damn phones, and adding the fact that when she goes on the tangent, she be speaking as fast as a lyrical miracle ass rapper. Damn, when you think about it, she got some good ass lungs for a prehistoric ass woman. Towards the end of the first day, we meet Penny Nichols, a part time assistant at Global Studios. Compared to the other characters we're about to meet, she's the more normal one out of the bunch. She's a massive fan of the Steel Samurai and managed to help Phoenix a couple times during the investigation. On the second day of the investigation, Phoenix and Maya would meet Salmonella. You know, like the bacteria Salmonella. Yeah, honestly, this is the best play on words I've seen yet in this game. Also, if you couldn't tell, a lot of the characters' names are play on other words and shit. It's, it's weird. He's the director of Steel Samurai, and I don't know if this man's design is supposed to represent your standard otaku, but whatever the case is, this dude is ugly as 
fuck. I don't know if this was the image that they were going for, but he looks greasy as all hell. And there's one spray in particular that even in the DS version always creeped me out. And it looks something like this. <gasps> what the? The last two characters we meet are Cody Hackins, a kid who's a massive fan of the Steel Samurai, and D. Vaquez. Vaquez? Vaquez? Uh, six and a half hours later. I think I got it right. Uh, fuck it. We'll find out later. Sees the producer at Global Studios and is the epitome of someone who does not give a damn about anything. Overall, most of the characters I've missed for this case helps to make it a lot more comedic and less somber than how it was in Turnabout Sisters. As for the investigation itself, it's full of nothing but questions. Unlike the first Turnabout and Turnabout Sisters, the murder in this case is a lot more bizarre. It involves the victim Jack Hammer, who was found dead in Studio One. Yet when you go and check out the crime scene, you notice that there's not a lot of blood where he died at. And as you continue going through the investigation, you end up coming across more questions than answers, such as whether or not Will's alibi is true true or not, who was in the Steel Samurai costume, where's the costume at, and where was the actual murder at? This turns the investigation into a matter of finding something to answer at least one of these questions. Even then, it takes a while to do so, from witnesses not really wanting to talk, to barely finding any evidence at all. It gets so tough in fact that Maya ends up calling Mia to hell, which works, but they still don't come up with much. It isn't until the last day of their investigations where they manage to come across something. Now, my feelings on this case aren't as harsh as it was when I was younger, though I was slamming my head to the wall trying to make sense of this shit. And once the trial in this case starts, Parts, it's equally as difficult and also comedic as shit. The main goal when going through the trials in this case is to press the hell out of the witnesses. Just like how it was in the investigation portion, they don't want to talk for a variety of reasons. Besides the first day where Old Bag is coached by Esworth to omit details from her testimony, the rest almost feels like a tedious game of tic-tac-toe just to get some info out of them. On the other hand though, the trials are not only short, but they're also comedic as fuck. When we saw Esworth during the trial for Hernabout Sisters, he's calm and collected when when going against Phoenix. However, this isn't the case here as Esworth is constantly getting the shit end of the stick. He has an old woman who's trying to fuck him, a kid who basically doesn't give a shit about the adults besides Mia, and later a witness who just brushes him off 24-7. He might have come off as a ruthless prosecutor when we first saw him, but Turnabout Samurai almost humanizes him to an extent. He even gets to the point where he works with us during the final day of the trial after realizing that our client is innocent. And by that point, you'll probably ask yourself, hmm, is Ezra truly a villain? And to answer that, yes and no. How I see it, most of the quote unquote villains in the story are all occupied by the killers. Besides a few cases in the franchise, the prosecutors are more or less, I guess, a deuterogonist or is it a tritagonist? I'm not sure, but they sure as hell aren't villains. Ezworth is an example of this as he has the same motivation as Phoenix to carry out justice, but the two have completely different viewpoints that ends up putting them at odds with one another. The later games does this as well, with some even going as far as to challenge Phoenix's ideas of what it means to be an attorney. It's something that's really interesting Interesting, but for now, let's put a pen on that because we got a case to finish. As the second day of the trial comes to a close, Phoenix comes to the realization that not only was Jack Hammer the one in the Steel Samurai costume, but the murder could have been somewhere else entirely, and he's able to prove it by presenting an empty bottle of sleeping pills that he found when questioning Cody. The bottle contained Hammer's fingerprints and ends up providing an alibi for Will, who was unknowingly drugged by the victim. This ends up causing the trial to go on for one more day, and during Phoenix and Maya's investigation, they learn about an incident that happened at Global studio. We learn from both Penny and Old Bag that five years prior to the events of the case, Jack Hammer was involved in the accidental death of his co-star. While shooting a fight scene, Hammer accidentally pushed his co-star onto a flower bed fence, instantly killing him. In the mayhem of everything, a paparazzi took a photo of what happened, but was silenced by the mafia, courtesy of D. Vaquez, who is now the producer at Global Studios. And after getting the photo of the incident from Old Bag, he presents it to Vaquez, where she proceeds to call up the mafia to try to silence him. I feel like we've done this before. Just as Phoenix and Maya are about to get got, Gumshoe pops out of fucking nowhere and arrests D. Vaquez, making her the final witness. However, proving that she murdered Hammer is going to be another issue entirely. The final day of the trial begins, and the moment D. Vaquez is called to the stand, the trial turns into a game of wits. And I'm not saying it just to say it, she truly feels like the epitome of a boss battle. For everything that you draw at her, she will draw a whole kitchen sink at your ass. 
deaths. And that's exactly what happens when she brings up the lack of evidence to prove that she could have killed Hammer. But with the help of Edgeworth, she is forced to testify how she found the body, and it gives Phoenix the chance to realize that the murder happened in an unexpected way. He explains that D-Vac Quest was supposed to be the victim as she's essentially been controlling Hammer's career ever since the incident from five years ago. And when he drugged our client and took the Steel Samurai costume, Hammer was going to get his revenge. However, as he was going to attack Vac Quest, she pushed him off the stairs onto a flower bed fence, which killed him in the same way Hammer's co-star did all those years back. Vac Quest accepts defeat and we learn that the actor who died was Manuel, who she might have had a special connection with, it's never really explained. Afterwards, Will Powers gets the not guilty verdict, celebrating yet another win. As the case comes to a close though, we're greeted with Edgeworth who congratulates Powers in his innocence, and before leaving, Edgeworth warns Phoenix to basically stay away from him, confirming that these two might have known each other. Unfortunately for Edgeworth, he's gonna have to call on Phoenix for something that's about to happen soon. Turnaround Samurai used to be one of my most disliked cases in this game. Even with a guy trying to figure out where to go and what to do next was always annoying as shit to go through. But this playthrough and my last actually made me change my opinion a bit. Now, don't get me wrong, I am still not a big fan of the investigation portions of this case, but the trials were short enough to the point where I really didn't mind too much. Plus, it was pretty convenient to the point where I even laughed a bit. Then what makes this case a highlight for me was the killer D. Vaquez and her quote-unquote motive. Now, the last two cases had motives that were pretty typical for the reason why you would kill someone. Frank Sawhead killed out of convenience, and Red White killed to silence someone who was about to expose him. But you get to D. Vaquez and you see that she doesn't really have a motive. All of it came from Hammer, and if she hadn't fucked up that man's career, things might have been different. In a way, it's somewhat like karma, so like what goes around comes around type shit, you know? And this is something I've always enjoyed about Ace Attorney. It shows off a lot of the nuances regarding the reason why someone would want to kill. In the case for D-Vac Quest, she would have been murdered all because of the grudge she held towards Hammer after that incident. And I really can't wait to talk about some of the other cases in this franchise, which adds more bits of nuances, especially trials and tribulations. But it's time to talk about the penultimate case for this game, and prepare yourself because there is a lot that's about to go down and there is a lot that we have to talk about. On the night of Christmas Eve, we see two men on the boat in the middle of the lake. And after one of the men explains how after 15 years he would finally have his revenge, he shoots the other man on the boat. And in the aftermath of the murder, we get a shocking revelation when we see Miles Edgeworth picking up the pistol. We cut to Christmas morning where Phoenix and Maya are talking about finding a place for her to train her powers, and while watching the news, they find out that Edgeworth has been arrested for murder. The two rush over and come across a disgruntled Edgeworth who tells Phoenix that he doesn't want him to represent him in court. Not wanting to abandon him, Phoenix and Maya begin their investigation into a case that's about to bring back old wounds. Turnabout Goodbyes is the last case in this game and is often considered to be one of the more iconic cases in this series. It's a favorite for good reason, with most people mentioning the twists and turns this case goes through. But the reason why I love this case is how we see the context of one character change, that being Miles Edgeworth. He's the main prosecutor in this game, and throughout this case, we learn that he isn't exactly the same person we've seen in past cases. Before, we saw Ezra as someone who was cold, meticulous, and would do anything to get a guilty verdict. One of his main tactics we see him do to achieve this is coaching his witnesses to omit certain parts of their testimony. But towards the end of Turnabout Samurai, he ends up working with us to take down the killer of that case. And from here, you get this idea that he might not be the demon prosecutor the game makes him out to be. And with us having to defend Edgeworth here, we spend a good amount of time understanding what happened to him to get to this point, from his childhood all the way until now. And we also get an idea of his upbringing as a prosecutor, which was taught to him by a new character we'll meet later on. Now, before, this wasn't something I cared too much about, but ever since my fifth playthrough last year, I ended up having a better appreciation for how we see this character go from being like a villain to his true self. There's also the subtle homoerotic subtext with him and Phoenix that I didn't even realize until like two to three years ago. And while we're on the topic of characters, unlike in Turnabout Samurai, was introduced a boatload of new characters. Turnabout Goodbyes only introduces three new characters, with some of them being characters that we've seen in past cases. 
While it isn't much, it does make sense, especially with how this case eventually plays out. For the new characters in this case, we first have Lotta Hart, an investigative reporter who is looking for a lake monster known as Gordy. She's a loud country bumpkin, but ends up being a major help when she gives Phoenix a photograph that brings out some inconsistencies with how the murder happened. She also tells us about one of the other new characters who was a witness to the murder, the caretaker. He's an old man that runs a rental boat shop, even though he's not exactly there mentally. And if you're wondering whether or not this man even has a name, he does but saying it will spoil one of the big twists in this case. Beyond those two, we also see the return of two characters who we briefly saw in the first Turnabout and Turnabout Sisters respectfully. The first of these characters is Larry Butts. He's one of Phoenix's childhood friends and is the definition of eccentric. He even has his own catchphrase. When something smells, it's usually the butts. I feel like that's enough said about his character right there. And finally is Marvin Grossberg, a defense lawyer and Mia's former boss. Even though these two are here for different reasons, they both end up helping out in different ways. Grossberg helps with some of the details of this case and Larry practically saves it with a testimony that while helpful, is full of him just yapping his ass off. And there's one other new character in this case, but we're gonna hold on to that for a bit and talk about the investigation in this case, which is... it's weird. For the most part, the investigation portion of this case is basically everything that you have been doing for the last two cases, nothing new there. But each of the days besides the last day is long as hell. And it isn't because of the pacing or the fact that you're gonna be moving back and forth between areas a lot. No, it's because this case introduces some lore about some of the characters in this game that we've met so far mainly Phoenix and Edgeworth. One of these pieces of lore we learned about involves Phoenix's motivation for becoming a defense attorney, which we learn is thanks to Edgeworth. When they were kids, he defended Phoenix in a class trial involving who stole the class's lunch money. While this one is to give you a good idea of the dynamic between Phoenix and Edgeworth, there is one bit of lore that ends up becoming the basis for this whole entire case, that being DL6. For those who need a quick refresher, DL6 was a bizarre murder case introduced in Turnabout Sisters. Up until this point, we knew that this case became the catalyst for Mia becoming a defense attorney, but there's a lot more to the story that we didn't know about until now, because when we meet with Grossberg to talk about the murder, we find out that the victim in this case was Grossberg's old associate, Robert Hammond, who was also the defense attorney for the DL6 case. And after showing off a picture of Missy Faye to Edgeworth, we learned that he too was involved in this case, with the possible connection that the murder had with DL6 being the main reason why he didn't want Phoenix to defend him. And from here is when we get the full picture of what happened. 15 years prior to the events of the game, Edgeworth, his father Gregory Edgeworth, and a bailiff were trapped in an elevator after an earthquake. As the oxygen was slowly decreasing, the bailiff, in a panic, attacked Edgeworth's father. And in an attempt to stop the fighting, Edgeworth throws a pistol that had fallen out of the bailiff's belt, causing it to go off. And in the aftermath, Edgeworth found his father dead alongside the unconscious bailiff. While investigating the circumstances of the murder, the police became so desperate for clues that they called on Misty Faye to use their powers to talk to the victim. And despite giving the name of the man who killed him being the bailiff in the elevator, Yanni Yogi, when the case went to trial, Robert Hammond managed to get Yogi a not guilty plea by claiming insanity. And when the case closed, Yanni Yogi would end up disappearing alongside Mia and Maya's mother, Misty Faye. Now, from this point on, the investigation goes from not just finding the killer in this case, but also the truth surrounding DL6. Furthermore, that's that new character I haven't talked about yet for good reason, because with Edgeworth being our defendant, we have a new prosecutor to go against that's also connected to DL6, that being Manfred Von Karma. Von Karma is the new character and prosecutor for this case, and I want you to imagine him as Edgeworth, but a lot more demonic. He's the one that taught Edgeworth what it means to be a prosecutor, every tactic, dirty tricks, and everything. But whereas Edgeworth still played fair in the scheme of things, Von Karma is the direct opposite. And because of this, he's never lost a case in his 40 years as a prosecutor. I want to remind you too that this is Phoenix's fourth ever case at this point in the story. And if you're digging to yourself, oh man, are we fucked? Yes, we are fucked. Unlike Edgeworth, Von Karma is a bitch and a half to deal with during trials. He's aggressive and leaves no rooms for questions of any kind. And throughout the trials in this case, he'll intimidate you with penalties, constantly object to anything you say, and what's worse is that he'll make it hard for you to press the witness. If you like to press everything like I do, 
Good luck trying to do that, and what's worse is that this is the first case in this game where we don't have the assistance of Mia. That is because of Maya's spiritual power being weak from the lack of training. Overall, the trials in this case are the most stressful they've been yet. You're basically spending each day of the trials avoiding the many traps that Von Karma throws out. And what's funny is that during the second day of the trial, Phoenix ends up getting caught up in one of his traps, causing you to technically lose the case. Of course, it doesn't end that quickly, but it shows just how dedicated he is to getting the guilty verdict. The dude even makes the judge his bitch, and I wouldn't be surprised if he were to backhand slap him. And that's not even half of the shit he does, because the shit he pulls towards the end of the case is straight up diabolical. As the case slowly comes to an end, a series of revelations begins to reveal itself. The first comes from Edgeworth, who throughout this case has been alluding to us about a nightmare that he doesn't know is true or not, and we eventually learn that Edgeworth believes he was the one responsible for killing his father, with Phoenix quickly realizing that Khan Karma might use that against him. Speaking of Von Karma, Phoenix and Maya finds a letter in the caretaker's safe, which details how the caretaker can get revenge against Edgeworth. Come to find out the person who wrote the letter was Von Von Karma, and we find this out thanks to Grossberg, who also tells us that he basically has a disdain for Edward's father after he exposed him for using false evidence. And something to keep in mind is that after he was exposed, he took his first and last vacation due to an injury. Something that again, you should keep in mind of. And as Phoenix and Maya head to the police department to get some evidence surrounding DL6, they discover that all of it is gone, and this is all thanks to Von Karma. But for some fucking reason, as if Phoenix had forgotten the other two times he's done this, he presents the revenge letter that Von Karma wrote for the caretaker. And guess what happens? Von Karma pulls out a stun gun. Who would have thought that showing evidence to the killer would end up leading to bad things happening? And at first, the stun gun doesn't sound that bad compared to the shit that we've already been through. <laughs> that is, until you find out that the bitch is over 600,000 volts. Huh? Yeah, no. Fuck that. This nigga needs to go to jail right now. Fuck that. He needs to go under the jail. Actually, better yet. Bitch, shoot him. Von Karma tases the shit out of the two and takes the majority of Phoenix's evidence relating to DL6. And despite things seeming hopeless, Maya managed to get her hands on the bullet that killed Edward's father, which Phoenix believes might be the key to changing everything. On the final day of the trial, Phoenix struggles to prove that the caretaker is Yanni Yogi, the bailiff from the DL6 case. That is, until Karma jokingly suggests it for Phoenix to cross-examine the caretaker's pet parrot. And if you're thinking to yourself, what can make this case even more wild? Phoenix Wright, with all his might cross-examines a parrot. You know, I still remember my first reaction coming across this scene and being like, what the fuck just happened? There is no way in hell that this ends up working. Oh boy, oh boy. At first, it doesn't amount to much, but when the judge calls for the caretaker to tell the court his name, the caretaker drops the act and reveals himself to be Yanni Yoki. He confesses to killing the victim in this case and is soon apprehended. And so, Ezra gets the not guilty verdict, and until he says fuck it and brings up DL6, with Karma using this as an opportunity to find Ezra guilty. Damn, damn, damn! While Edgeworth and the others are trying to figure out what to do next, Phoenix goes through his court records, wink wink, and prepares to prove that Edgeworth is innocent. At first, Phoenix is able to point out a possibility of the gun being shot twice, but it's quickly disproven due to there being only one bullet at the scene of the crime. And as Phoenix is about to give up, he hears a voice from Mia saying that the second bullet exists and to think outside the box. From here, he proposes the theory that the second bullet does exist, but in a different context. Instead of the killer being inside the elevator, he was outside of it. When a young Edgeworth threw the pistol that fell from the bailiff's belt, and the killer was struck by said bullet, and after the elevator opened, the killer shot Edward's father and left the scene of the crime. Despite Von Karma quickly shutting down the theory, Maya remembers what Grossberg said about Von Karma being injured, and seeing Phoenix realizes that he is the killer. While Von Karma shows little to no care about the theory at first, Phoenix busts out a metal detector given to him by Gumshoe and requests to use it, and this freaks Von Karma the fuck out. Out, to the point of begging the judge to deny the request. Unfortunately for him, Phoenix is given the okay to use it and finds that the second bullet is inside of Von Karma. While he tries to play it off with no care in the world, Phoenix presents the bullet that Maya took from Von Karma the day before and suggests checking the ballistic markings. This leads to Von Karma having a complete and other breakdown. We learned that he did kill Edward's father for tainting his perfect record. Which, when you think about it, shit's fucked up. And for the second time this trial, Ezra gets the not guilty verdict. 
Phoenix and the others celebrate with Ezworth taking him for all that he's done. However, the day after, Phoenix wakes up to a note from Maya saying that she's going back home to train so that she can help him more. Phoenix rushes to the train station and after showing her the bullet she nabbed from Von Karma to prove just how helpful she was, Maya leaves for home a lot more content and Phoenix enters a new step into his career as a defense attorney. Turn about goodbyes is so damn good. While writing the script, I had some trouble trying to put into words why I love this case so much. There's the fact that Danes from prior cases such as the characters in DL6 are heavily connected with this case, the absolute roller coaster that you go through while going through the investigations and trials, and honestly, there's so much that I can make a whole separate video on it. Probably won't, but still. But if there was one thing that really made this case one of my favorites, it was how well they connected the past with the present. DL6 was introduced as a case that was filled with mystery and foreshadowing for certain characters. And when we get to turn about goodbyes, we see this mystery get explained and eventually solved as the case continues. But this was done in a way where we see just how much it affected the characters involved. We mainly see this with Edgeworth, who's practically the main star of this case, and it's someone who has to deal with the worst of everything. Not only is he convicted of a murder that he never committed, he is also forced to confront the events of DL6 under the most traumatizing situation. Nothing involving therapy, all of it involves him having to fight for his life in the fucking courtroom. And when you look back on how that incident shaped the lives of both him and the Faye sisters, you start to realize that it was basically their canon event. If DL6 had never happened, Edgeworth might have become a defense attorney instead of a prosecutor. Mia would have never left home to be an attorney and investigate Red White, and as for Phoenix, well, honestly, I think he still might have become an attorney because of Edgeworth. But the impact of DL6 and how the characters deal with it in this case is what made this one of my favorites. I hate that I can't talk more about it though because DL6 is a part of something even bigger that the next game sets up. God damn it! Now, this would be the part where, you know, we start to wrap things up and shit, but uh, we actually have one more case to talk about. When the DS port of this game was released, we were introduced to Rise from the Ashes. It was an extra episode created for two purposes. The first was to take advantage of the DS's hardware, which the team did by adding new gameplay elements into the investigation. And the last purpose was to show the catalyst for something that happens to Ezra in the next game, Justice for All. Now, Rise from the Ashes is the first in terms of how divisive it is. Despite there being many people who consider this to be a top 10 or even top 5 in the franchise, there are people who do not like this case at all. For me, this is one of my favorites, but I do have to agree with a lot of the criticisms made about it. Mainly, it's length and the uh, it's very tedious nature of the trials. Other than that though, this case has some of the best story moments in this game. It's so good that it even beats out some of the moments in Turnabout Goodbyes. And because of how long this case is, and the fact that this part has been a struggle to write about, I'm only going to be talking about some of the big plot stuff here. That being the parallels and subversions that this case has to some of the others in this game, the relationship between Emma and Lana Skye, and all the bullshit that Ezra has to go through in this case. So with that said, let's quickly go through Rise from the Ashes. On a stormy night, we quickly pass through a set of tall buildings and later see a silhouette of someone with a knife. As they are raising it and about to strike, things come to a freeze and reveals two versions of this mysterious person in two different locations. And when things come back to, we quickly see the knife come down, a vase break, and a weird looking mascot, with the last thing we see being the aftermath of everything in an obscure silhouette. Fast forward a bit and it's been about two months since Ezra's trial and ever since Maya left for home, Phoenix lost the desire to defend anyone. That is, until he comes to the office and meets Emma Sky, a high school student who is working to become a scientific investigator. She came to Phoenix to ask for him to defend her sister and chief prosecutor Lana Sky. Despite Lana already confessing to the crime and insisting Phoenix to not take up the case, he does so anyway and sets out with the help of Emma Sky to find the truth behind the murder. Like I mentioned before, Rise from the Ashes is one of the more divisive cases in this game, with people either considering it to be the best in the original trilogy or the worst. But what exactly makes this case the worst you may ask. In my opinion, and honestly probably others as well, it has to be the gameplay. But let's start off positive because this case fixes an issue I had with the investigations. Even though you're still going around talking to people and finding evidence like per usual, with the assistance of Emma Sky, you end up doing a lot of different things that mostly connect to our passion of being a scientific investigator. One of the things you can do immediately is examining your evidence in full 3D. Doing this lets you discover things that either would have been something you couldn't have found otherwise or 
or would have been given to you later in that case. Starting with the second day of the investigation, you'll get access to luminal fluid and a fingerprint set. The luminal fluid allows you to check for blood stains in the area that you're in. Pretty self-explanatory. Then there's the fingerprint set that allows you to apply dust on the fingerprint to reveal it and compare it to the people you met so far in the case. Now, this is deadly because you might end up spending upwards of 10 to 15 minutes trying to make the whole damn screen white. It's both relaxing and funny as hell to do. You'll also come across different little mini games like putting the pieces of a shattered vase together or trying to make said vase look like the blue badger. And no matter how many times I play this game, this shit is always fucking annoying. Beyond that, the new additions makes the investigations here a lot less monotonous and it further emphasizes the need to look through your evidence. Though, in spite of the additions, the investigation, and for that matter, the trial still has some bullshit to it. In order to advance any investigations, you're likely going to come across a scenario where you have to talk to the person in the area you're in, examine your surroundings, present evidence to said person, and rinse and repeat. Even though this was something you will come across before during like the base game and shit, you didn't have to do it for damn near everyone you meet. And don't even get me started on the trials, which have moments where you gotta go around the mulberry bush to present your evidence at the contradiction. This is even worse with the first day as during the first half of the trial, you have to break down a series of testimonies which eventually reveals itself to be a lie. Yeah, I would not blame you for not wanting to deal with all of that shit. Alongside the pacing, I can understand the annoyance people have with this case. And it sucks because the story moments are the highlights in this case. And it's as good, if not slightly better or even better than Turnabout Goodbyes. The funny thing about Rise from the Ashes is that it has a lot of parallels to Turnabout Goodbyes and some of the other cases in this game. However, this case is even crazier than the past cases, with the murder being more bizarre, the old case connected to this one being even more complex and their story moments that are bound to shock you. Even the killer here is more of a scumbag than Von Karma and that's pretty hard to do but they somehow managed it. And like I mentioned before, a lot of the parallels from past cases can be seen here in Rise from the Ashes. Most of it is connected to the last case Turnabout Goodbyes with the most obvious parallel being a past case that becomes relevant again known as SL9. It was a case that happened two years prior to the events of the game and similar to DL6, it becomes a major point of interest while investigating. But what stands out about it is the subversion that it ends up making. It involved a serial killer named Joe Dark, who would go on a killing spree after accidentally running over and killing the man. He would later go and kill anyone else who had witnessed East's previous murder he committed. Despite turning himself in, he would end up escaping and killing one last person. And this is where the subversion start, because unlike DL6, which remained unsolved for 15 years, SL9 was considered solved with Joe Dark getting the guilty verdict and later being executed. In spite of that though, SL9 was filled with questions and mysteries regarding the aftermath which caused the case to come back into the spotlight. And mentioning this case is important because more of these parallels and subversions pop up with three other characters, Emma and Lana Skye and Miles Edgeworth. Starting with the Sky sisters, their dynamic is a parallel to the dynamic of the Face sisters. Whereas those two had each other's back and had love for one another, it isn't exactly the same with the Sky sisters. In the beginning of the case, Lana is cold towards Emma to the point where you wonder if the two are even sisters. Sisters. Yet we see Emma have an immense respect for her older sister to the point of idolizing her. And as the case continues, we learn that Lana wasn't always like this. She used to be a lot more cheerful, happy. But when SL9 happened, things ended up changing. And this is because during the events of SL9, Emma ended up accidentally killing someone that night, not Joe Dart. And in an effort to protect her sister from getting prosecuted, she went as far as to force evidence to ensure that she wasn't seen as a suspect. Keep that fake evidence in mind though because it's going to come back up in a bit. Despite this essentially being a subversion between the relationship of Mia and Maya, the one thing to understand is that despite Lana being the coldest witch in this game, she has a lot of love for her little sister Emma. She's willing to do anything to the point of taking the possible risk of either being in prison or at worst getting the death penalty to protect her. And once you realize this, it starts to slowly make sense on why Lana was so cold to Emma even though this also affected Phoenix, who practically was fighting for his fucking life in court. Anyway, remember that fake evidence that I mentioned just a couple minutes ago? Well, uh, it's connected pretty heavily to the next character, 
Edgeworth. By the time Rise from the Ashes begins, Edgeworth is still going through some healing after everything that happened two months ago. And even though he's still largely the same, things are a bit different. He isn't as cold to the people close to him, and during the trials in this case, he doesn't do any of the underhanded shit he used to do, and it's all in an effort to sort of atone for the shit he's done throughout the game. But this case does not care if he's in the process of changing, and as things continue, he ends up having to deal with the worst of everything again. There's the fact that the victim's body was found inside Ezra's car, and that the witnesses practically distrust Ezra, which is understandable. But the worst yet is when Lana reveals that they used fake evidence to convict Joe Dark during the SL9 trial, something that Ezra claimed he would never do and practically despises the idea of doing it. And with everything that continues to go down in this case, it really comes to a head when we find out that there was someone controlling the outcome of this case, and that's the killer here, Damon Gant. Now, let me level with y'all real quick. Talking about Rise from the Ashes had already been a struggle to talk about, especially because of the amount of shit that happens in this case. Because alongside the things Ezra goes through, Gant is one of the best things about this case. And I don't know if this is the case for everyone within the fandom, but in my personal opinion, Damon Gant is one of, or at least a good top contender for one of the best Ace Attorney villains. Gant is almost like Von Karma for how scummy he can be, but unlike Karma, Gant is a lot more threatening because of the fact that he plays by the books. Everything he's done in this case besides murdering the victim, Detective Goodman, has largely been legal. During the events of SL9, he was responsible for covering up the murder scene to make it look like Joe Dark was the one who killed someone, orchestrating the forced evidence for Lana so that it could be used during the trial, and basically fucking with Ezra during this case by constantly derailing anything that he's been doing. Mind you, apart from the murder, everything that Gant has done was legal. Let me stress that again, it was legal. Legal. The reason why I'm stressing this is because one of the main themes of this case was police corruption. This was something Shutakami wanted to explore, and it works perfectly with the motivation of Gan. Something to understand was that he wasn't the bastard that we currently know him as. In the past, he was like Phoenix and Edgeworth when it came to their view of justice. But throughout his years as a detective, he witnessed criminals being able to get away with crimes. And in the case of SL9, where Joe Dark almost went free, he did not want that to happen, setting him down a path of using the law and his loopholes to his advantage. And what makes this even more insane is that Damon Gant ends up almost delivering us a case of mutually assured destruction. During the final day of the investigation, you find a piece of evidence that has Emma's fingerprints on them, and we later learn that it was from the person Emma accidentally killed during the events of SL9, with Gant having kept this evidence as a deterrent against Lana, who he has been blackmailing after the events of that case. And from here, you're presented with a complicated dilemma on how you should show it off, because if you present it too quick, Emma will be prosecuted, and that threat alone affects how you go about things. Another thing to keep in mind is that this murder was accidental, but under the eyes of that world's judicial system, it's still seen as murder. That right there is what makes Gant more of a scumbag and a threat than Von Karma. The fact that he kept that piece of evidence and knew it could be used to ruin Emma's future is enough to earn him the title of the ultimate bastard. Even when you do take him down at the end, Gant compares himself to Ezworth, which causes him to feel conflicted about his own ideology surrounding law and the justice system. And even though this case ends positively for others, for Ezworth, it ends up ending with him choosing death. Even though Rise from the Ashes is one of the more divisive cases in the franchise, it's it's one of my favorites when it comes to the story and characters. A lot of it is the subversions that we saw from the past cases in this game, like how Emma and Lana's relationship mirrors the Faye sisters' relationships, or how morally great things get with the law. And whenever I go back to playing this game, this case is the one I'm always looking forward to going back to even though the gameplay isn't exactly the best. Beyond that though, if you do end up playing this game, I implore y'all to go through it because it's more than worth it to experience this story, especially because of how it plays out in the bigger scale of things. That's also me not trying to spoil this shit and god damn it, I really need to hurry up and go through these games. It's already the end of fucking July. <laughs> Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney is one of the best examples of starting a franchise off strong. While this wasn't my first Ace Attorney game, it was the one that got me to continue playing through the games. You have a vibrant cast of characters that are not only unique, but are memorable for every moment that they have. It also helps that the characters are weird and eccentric to the point of making the more depressing moments a little bit more comedic. Speaking of memorable, despite playing this over six times now, every playthrough still feels fresh to an extent. Like I know what happens and what's gonna happen, but getting there still gives off 
off the same feeling of excitement and shock from when I first played it. Going through and finding that motive and analyzing it really makes you think about its connection to the evidence you find. Like it's crazy to imagine how this one piece of evidence becomes the catalyst for finding the real killer. And if that didn't make sense, I don't blame you. I blame the amount of crime shows that I watched growing up with my mom. And also the true crime YouTube videos that have been coming out lately, like those shits are actually pretty addicting. And I can't forget about the music, which is not only catchy, but helps you get into whatever move the game is trying to get off. The music that plays while cross-examining someone and the music that plays when you're about to corner the witness is hands down the best tracks in this whole game. Finally, it's a story, which even though it kind of feels disjointed when you first play it, I think it does a great job at its world building and having moments that become important in some way, shape, and form. Whether it be the way that the DL6 incident shaped the lives of Maya, Mia, Edgeworth, and even Phoenix to an extent. And what sucks is that there's so much more that this game sets up, but I can't even talk about it yet. God damn it! But with all the great things this game does, there's still some uh, meh moments. The gameplay here is the most simple compared to future titles, which does make going back to this game slightly hard to do. Though a lot of the criticism I mentioned before about this game was how tedious and boring it gets. I agree that some parts are tedious, specifically with the investigations, but the game is far from boring in my opinion. A lot of it comes from how tense the trials can be, especially as the three days go by, and I argue that another thing that makes this game not boring is the writing. You have comedic moments, sad moments, and absolutely deranged moments that grabs your attention instantly. It also helps that all the sprites are really good. The DS slash GBA originals are all memorable and has this quality to it that makes you surprised at how well they were able to portray different emotions. And even though the HD trilogy sprites aren't as good to some, to me, I think they serve their purpose and you can still get a good laugh out of some of them. There's a particular sprite that Phoenix has that goes for him from looking all professional to him looking like, ah shit, I forgot to pay my rent. So, should you play Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney? Yes! but with some caveats. If you do want to play these games, I suggest playing this and the other games through the trilogy collection. While it doesn't have much in terms of additional features, it does allow you to play through the original trilogy with updated sprites. The music, for some bizarre reason though, didn't get updated and I think it's based on either the DS or GBA original. Speaking of which, if you do want to play the DS version or the GBA version, you can with the latter being courtesy of a fan translation. Just be prepared to go through the hell that is pixel hunting and maybe also get a guide on standby. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching till the end of the video. Again, I do want to apologize for making y'all wait this long for this video. Uh, for some bizarre reason, it's been a combination of things that's been making it hard to write this video. One being like this extreme writer's block. Writer's block. Jesus Christ. <laughs> See, I've been having a bad case of writer's block recently, and for some reason, I can't write videos to save my fucking life for writing jokes and shit. Then you have the fact that Ace Attorney is already a story dense franchise, so it's kind of hard to talk about everything and condense it into one video, you know? Um, there might be some like other stuff mentally or environmentally, but I don't even know at this point. At this point, I'm just glad I managed to get this out to you guys before September, because they almost got to that point. I'm going to try to stop making any promises, because clearly I, if when I do, I fuck up somewhere. But... I can say that currently, at the time of me recording this video, I'm about to get started recording Justice For All, the next game that we're going to be reviewing. Luckily, it is on the shorter side with only four cases overall, and those four cases do go by pretty quickly, so fingers crossed maybe? Maybe? Uh... Also, before we end things, I have one last thing that I kind of want to bring up to you guys. Let me know in the comments if you guys wouldn't mind seeing some other videos or even reviews while I'm doing retrospectives. I'm starting to realize that it's taking longer for me to make certain videos and such, and I know with this one, I promised that I wouldn't make y'all wait almost a month for this video, but y'all end up having to wait like two months damn there, and I'm trying to figure out a way so that I can give you guys more content without it feeling like a drought for like each month and shit. Again, if y'all want that, please let me know in the comments down below. Like always, make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video, hit the bell notification so you guys know when the next video is gonna be coming out. And I've also started streaming on Twitch again. So yay, you know, I started that like around late June, early July and stuff. And if you do wanna catch one of my streams, I'll be live on there every Saturday and Sunday starting at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. I might be adding one other day as well to kind of make a round out like three days and stuff, but that one is still in the card. So next video or video afterwards, I will let you guys know and make sure to stay safe, hydrate and stay cool because it's hot as a bitch outside and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.